Welcome, everyone. My name is Steve Pollack. I'm the president of the Historical Society of the DC Circuit. In behalf of the Society, I want to join with you in looking towards an exciting and unique program, the Reflections on Watergate. First, I want to thank David Frederick of the Kellogg Huber Law Firm who conceived and planned this program. He's a whiz. I also wish to thank Jeff Liss. He's chair of the Society's Program Committee. I also want to thank Time Warner for letting us use this fine cover of the representative of the court and the era. Now I'd like to introduce Carl Stern. He's the J.B. and Morris C. Shapiro Professor of Media and Public Affairs at the George Washington University. Carl is the former legal affairs correspondent for NBC News. He covered Watergate, and he will be our moderator today and introduce the panelists. Carl? Well, hello. These are wonderful programs, and I hope we'll, uh, I know we're going to have another one uh, today. This is the room uh, where in October of 1974, uh, the Watergate conspiracy trials began with the assembly of the prospective uh, jury members. And uh, I don't have to relate uh, to you uh, what Watergate uh, was about. We're talking about the uh, conspiracy trial of uh, John Mitchell, H.R. Haldeman, uh, John er Ehrlichman, uh, Robert Mardian, uh, and uh, Ken uh, Parkinson. Uh, the trial was originally scheduled to begin in September, but it was delayed because something happened in September after something had happened in August. What happened in August, of course, was the resignation of President Nixon. What happened in September, I think it was September 9th, uh, was that uh, Mr. Nixon was uh, pardoned uh, by uh, President uh, Ford, and that uh, required a delay. Is something making sounds? I'll back up. Uh, why don't we do this logically? Why don't we start at the end? Okay, uh, which is, should this have been a uh, criminal trial uh, at all? Was this really a criminal matter? Uh, Jim Neal, you were the prosecutor. Well, of course, I'm certainly not going to say as the prosecutor that I shouldn't have been prosecuting these people. Yes, it should have been a criminal trial. It involved uh, a serious obstruction of justice, paying money to keep the burglars quiet. It involved... Uh, Attempting to um, cause the corrupt the CIA to go to the department to the FBI and stop tracing the money uh, that the committee to reelect the president creep as I called him, but uh, some people might have had another name. But uh, from pay from the money that they used to do the break in, uh, there are a whole um, Plato Kacharis's client whom whom I prosecuted and chair and Plato defended, uh, even himself called uh, uh, the activities around that time the White House horrors, I believe, Plato. So sure, it should have been a prosecution. John, you were not involved, John Dean, in the uh, conspiracy trial, but you were at the, shall we say, the uh, receiving end uh, of these, uh, a decision to uh, prosecute the various uh, miscreants and, and felons involved in, in Watergate. Uh, do you believe it should have been a criminal matter? Well, first, I must say that uh, as Jim Neal would learn, my voice is picked up by any small microphone in any room. <laughs> when, I, uh, when I broke rank uh, at the White House, there was no question in my mind that what was going to be at the end of the line was going to be criminal trials, unless Nixon himself had been willing to come forward and uh, lay it out brutally for what it was, and those who were responsible and involved uh, similarly willing to stand up and be accounted for. So I, I can't say I was surprised by the trial. Uh, I don't know if my lawyer of that era, one of them is here, but the other who principally handled my work, was very disappointed in the sense when I decided to plead. Uh, he said to me, he said, John, you have the Oliver North case as a result of my Senate Watergate testimony before Oliver North even knew he had a case. 
he said, the government, he said, I'm convinced, can't successfully prosecute you. Uh, I happened to say to Charlie that I thought that was sort of self-defeating because I'd already said to the world, indeed, what I had done, and it was time to stand up and, and accept my punishment for it. So uh, I happened to be with Jim that I don't think there was any question that these things had to be brought uh, to justice in some form. Uh, when, the, uh, when President Nixon was uh, pardoned, that posed uh, new wrinkles and new complications. In fact, some of the prospective jurors uh, in this uh, room uh, suggested uh, that uh, they were concerned that the top gun, so to speak, the top person, uh, was not going to be on trial. What complications did that pose for, for, the, for Judge Sirikit? Todd, you were his clerk. Uh, and uh, uh, Plato, uh, for, you were co-counsel for John Mitchell. What complications did that represent uh, for you? I'll start with Todd. It, it was a concern of the judges that uh, there be a him panel a jury that was in fact impartial and that could be perceived besides the fact that they were impartial. And uh, he had a lot of faith in the jury system and in the people of the District of Columbia and he was willing to go ahead. He didn't see initially any need for delay because of the pardon. Uh, but the Court of Appeals, as you know, suggested he wait, so he did wait some weeks before beginning the jury selection. But he felt, as you've suggested, that if anything, it cut in favor of the defendants. That is, that it, the perception that if the top man in the conspiracy was going to be unindicted, named in a way, but unindicted, and, and would not suffer any... Uh, accountability for what had happened, many jurors would probably feel they ought not to take anybody under him and uh, apply punishment in their case either. So he felt like it didn't hurt the impartiality of the jurors or that they could still get an impartial jury. Uh, but if anything, it would favor the defendant. Yeah, come on, we can keep a secret. Did Judge Sirica blow his top when he heard that President Nixon had been pardoned? What was his reaction? He was, he was of two minds about that. I mean, like much of the country was. He did think uh, that there was some unfairness in prosecuting others when Nixon was pardoned, but on this, by the same token, and this is just personal conversation, personal feelings of his, that uh, on the other hand, uh, it did save the country some ongoing turmoil that is hard to imagine what it was like now, but then it was such a daily event and, and a paralyzing event in government, he was thinking, on the other hand, maybe it's, maybe it's good to relieve the country of the burden of Watergate once and for all. Okay. Was this a gift, Plato, for the defense lawyers? View it that way. We didn't view it that way. This was a highly publicized trial, and on the eve of the trial, uh, one of the co-conspirators, and if you will, the chief co-conspirator, although unindicted, is pardoned. Uh, that, to me, sends a message that he needed to be pardoned and that people who would view the case objectively would say there was something wrong here, and I don't think that they were going to exonerate the underlings because uh, the president was pardoned. So I think it posed problems and has exacerbated the uh, publicity that already existed. Remember, we moved for change of venue. We never got it, and they still didn't get it. Uh, the heart, uh, though, of the defense, for example, Mr. Ehrlichman's defense, uh, represented by uh, Bill Frades, uh, was, I suppose, uh, twofold. Uh, number one, that you couldn't get a fair, that these defendants couldn't get a fair trial in, in the District of Columbia. I think they even had some statistics showing how many people in D.C. had voted for George McGovern, right? Uh, and uh, then, uh, secondly, that it was unfair to prosecute the, uh, the henchmen. Uh, when, the, when the chief uh, was, was not subject uh, uh, to prosecution. Uh, was that card played so strongly that it posed a problem for the government? Jim? John, John Mitchell and H.R. Haldeman basically said their posture was, well, I had, you know, I played the game. If they convict me, you know, I'll take it like a man, no whining from those. Uh, Ehrlichman, on the other hand, tried to say that he was a patsy, that Nixon had done it all, and Ehrlichman was the only one who played, uh, played to the empty chair. But it wasn't any really big problem. The big problem that we had at the special counsel's office was what to do about 
President Nixon between the time he resigned and the time he was pardoned. Uh, the, uh, Remember, uh, Jim, yeah. that every Friday morning, uh, Jack Miller would come in and give Judge Sirica a medical report on President Nixon. Right. That's right. We, we, we were following his medical, uh, his medical uh, condition closely because if we, of course, couldn't indict him after he was pardoned, but after he was pardoned, uh, we were trying to get President Nixon to court. His absence from the trial is quite an, another matter. The judge, Judge Sirica, sent the three doctors out to California to examine him, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, taking the longer view uh, of, of history, did it really make any difference that Carl, Nixon wasn't there? Carl, let me, let me yeah. throw something in I think that the audience should know. As a, uh, uh, I probably know more about Watergate today than when I was Jim Neal's witness. As I was telling the panel, behind the, uh, in chambers and back, in the back. Um, in 1991, a book was published that uh, defamed both myself and my wife. Now, I'm fair game, my wife isn't. And as a result of that, I ended up uh, with extensive discovery. Uh, I filed a defamation action, ended up reading all the memoirs of all the key players, read all their Senate testimony, read all their testimony in the trials, uh, uh, opened up with discovery through a subpoena, uh, a lot of the records of the Watergate Special Prosecutor's Office, uh, plowed through all that. And last year, the University of Kansas came to me and said, nobody has really addressed the U.S. versus Mitchell, Haldeman, Ehrlichman, X all trial. It was clearly one of the true, very large, great political trials of the 20th century. And the history of Watergate really ends today with Nixon getting on the helicopter in the South Lawn, and that's where uh, historians tend to, to leave the story. So I am early in the research, but for example, for the last two days, I've been out at the National Archives and really running the gamut. The Watergate Prosecutor's Office had a wonderful clipping file. They probably paid dearly for it, not the sort of thing the private... Uh, firms of those days would probably pony up for, but they did keep a massive file. And one of the interesting things, to come back to your question, is that uh, Nixon is clearly hovering over this entire trial. When you look at the headlines of the era, very seldom does a week go by, very seldom does a day go by, that Nixon doesn't come into play as a figure in connection with this trial. His absence is so conspicuous, and this particularly becomes true once the tapes uh, come into play. Well, uh, Ehrlichman's lawyer, Bill Frady, said it was vital that he, Nixon they, they, they had. I've often wondered if, how, how both the uh, prosecution and the defense had called for Nixon's testimony. I've been very curious to know uh, from Plato and from the judge and from uh, Jim how they felt, what, what Nixon would have done to that trial, what a, what a, uh, uh, it was already a three-ring circus with what was going on around but, town. But Todd, was Judge Sirica relieved secretly that President Nixon was not available? I don't think so. I don't know, to be honest, but I don't think so. He, uh, the, the panel of three judges was sent to examine him in California because of the, uh, I guess primarily because of John Ehrlichman's attorney moving to have him come as a witness or be subpoenaed. And uh, they, of course, in the end said, no, you know, he can't until sometime next year, which would have been 1975. His condition won't permit that, and so the trial went ahead without him. But uh, he never said anything that, uh, that gave me a definitive answer to your question, but I, I sense from what he wrote later in his book to set the record straight that he would like to have had him come and testify. And I think you know, when he finally comes down to a conclusion on that question, he thinks he should have been in court to testify. In looking at my notes, I see almost nothing from that time about plea bargaining. That's one small exception. In Judge Sirica's book, he talks about John Wilson coming back to in the, the chambers accompanied by some folks from the prosecutor's office uh, to, to try to sound out Judge Sirica. Before the trial started. This is before the trial started. As to what the judge uh, might uh, be willing to do uh, if Mr. Haldeman uh, pleaded Entered guilty. Plea, right. um, and uh, he 
the, the judge, judge declined, declined, declined to say, and yeah. uh, there was no plea. There must have been more. What about Mr. Mitchell? He never talked about a plea bargain? Well, uh, um, uh, Bill Hunley, who was my senior partner at the time and was in the case, and I was in the case with him, uh, did visit Jim Neal once and uh, it didn't get very far. Jim, as I recollection, uh, Mitchell would never take a plea if it required him to uh, point the finger at Nixon. He remained loyal to Nixon, and for that reason, I don't think he was interested. Well, in it was a fascinating so story, Carl. I, uh, Archie Cox was still the Watergate prosecutor, and Bill Hundley and I were old-time colleagues, along with uh, Plato, at the Kennedy Department of Justice. So I got a call one day from uh, Bill Hundley and said, Jim, you know, I've known you, you and our department together. I really didn't get to know Archie Cox, although Archie was Solicitor General, but that's a level that was above both Bill, Bill, both Bill and me, but I did happen to know Archie Cox a little bit. Um, and he said, I don't know Archie Cox, but would you, would you talk to Archie Cox and would you meet me, would you and Mr. Cox meet me somewhere to talk about a potential plea bargain uh, for John Mitchell. And he said, we've got to do this in some sort of way that, this, you know, you can't imagine how the media was back then. It, it, it's been, I guess it's been uh, succeeded by O.J. Simpson, but he was pretty close to that. Um, careful. <laughs> and, and so... And so uh, we worked out a way that Archie and I would get in a car. We would go to the basement of the U.S. Supreme Court building. Um, Bill Hundley would go and get in another car, and he would meet us up there. And we did that. we go up there in the basement of the Supreme Court building, and um, uh, Bill, Bill Hundley says, John Mitchell wants to plea bargain. He wants to enter a plea. And... We said, well, okay. Um, Archie said, well, Jim, you go down and meet Bill and meet John Mitchell. And we met, and I can't, the name, the name of the hotel has been changed now, but it was across from the downtown Hilton where um, uh, that Polynesian restaurant used to be. What's the name of that? Carlton. Yeah, the Carlton. We met at, the, at, a, at a suite at the Carlton, John Mitchell, Alberts. Bill Hundley, and myself. And Ben Benisti, Rick, Rick Ben Benisti may have been there. And uh, we go around, around, around to, uh, to cut to the chase, as they say in Hollywood. It turns out that what Mitchell was willing to do was to enter a plea to whatever we want him to plead to if we would call off the chase of the president. And, of course, we couldn't do that at that time. And that ended the... That ended the really only serious plea bargain that I know about. Uh, well, John, uh, other than John's. Uh, this was what, in September? It was, it was in the late summer, as I remember, of 1973, before the Saturday Night Massacre. And, 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 now, meanwhile, and, well, and, this my plea, and my plea of pardon was really as a result of Jim's relationship with my lawyer. No question. Because of your relationship with Charlie Schaffer, together they had tried. Prosecuted Jimmy Hoffa. <laughs> Jimmy Hoffa together. They had been through some wars. In fact, they spent more time sharing war stories than talking about my fate. <laughs> I think this was late summer of 74, and I think there's an untold story about where John Dean was uh, in late August and uh, September of 74, uh, coming in from Fort Holabird uh, uh, during the day to work here in the basement of this building to do so. Well, I want to talk about that. That's true. I, uh, little known to the defense, uh, after my testimony, I might say Plato, uh, but before my testimony, uh, I'll give two parts. Uh, to make sure that they could place the tapes into evidence because they were so key to the prosecution. There were 28 witnesses for the government. There were also 28 tapes. Uh, it's pretty hard to cross-examine a tape, and they were devastating. So I, I had the task of putting into evidence all the tapes to which I was party. Uh, Alex Butterfield had the job of putting into evidence all the tapes uh, to which nobody in the courtroom was, was actually a party. It was a little, little bit 
tougher issue from a legal standpoint. So Alex and I are down in the basement of this courthouse in a cage uh, with two recording machines listening to these things. It's the first time I've heard the, uh, the tapes. And some of the conversations are very easy. The telephone conversations are very easy. The EOB office, the Nixon's hideaway office, are very difficult to hear. The Oval Office, uh, with the exception of yours truly, who always seem to be sitting over a microphone, uh, they're very hard to hear. Uh, that turned out to be pretty good. That I was sitting over a microphone, as, as Jim recalls. But uh, so that was that was my introduction to the tapes, and then. After the trial started and after my testimony, uh, Jim and, and, and I guess Richard Benvenist and the others thought they needed, this was the pre-desktop computer era, and they needed somebody who would give them instant information if they needed it <clears throat> during a break. And they would come out and press a button on me, and out would come what they needed to uh, fill in the gap. So I actually saw this trial from many sides. I was back in the back room when the prosecutors came in uh, during a good hunk of the trial, particularly during the cross-examination phase. Uh, this is a bit of a digression, but you mentioned Alex Butterfield's name. Uh, later on in the course of the trial, apparently Mr. Haldeman wanted to call Butterfield as a character witness. Uh, Jim, do you recall uh, Rick Benvenisti uh, examined uh, Butterfield in the jury's uh, uh, absence uh, to uh, look for a line of questioning on cross, and do you recall uh, what uh, Ben Venisti extracted from him that uh, uh, discouraged Mr. Haldeman's lawyers from calling Butterfield as a character witness? No, I don't remember. Uh, well, uh, I'm, I'm not the witness here. You, te but, <laughs> you tell me. Uh, but, uh, but, Go ahead. Record, do you recall? No. Oh, well, I think the record shows that, that uh, Butterfield, under Ben Venisti's guidance, uh, was pre prepared to testify that Haldeman had authorized uh, an operation to spread a story that George McGovern, this was prior to the, in the 72 campaign, had fathered an illegitimate child. That's right. That's <laughs> that, right. That was the end of the efforts yeah. to call uh, Haldeman <laughs> as a character witness. But okay, just a digression. How Butterfield was, was it, Pardon me, how difficult was it to get the tapes into evidence? Well, but, but the, the tapes... And, and the lawyers in the audience will, will recognize this immediately. But the way you put in a, a recording that's relevant, uh, you um, prepare a transcript that is a guide. So you have the recording, the, the voice speaking, and you have a transcript that identifies the speaker and what is being said. The way you do this normally is you have somebody like John Dean, who was a part of the conversation that's being taped, and John can listen to the tape, and he knows the identity of the voice he's speaking. He can listen to the tape. He can compare that tape with our proposed transcript, and he can say, yes, I was there. This audio captures what was said by each person talking, and this transcript is an accurate uh, reproduction of the tape. And where, where, the, where John Dean was there with the uh, cancer growing on the presidency and all of that uh, wonderful language they used in the White House, and digressing a minute, the White House says when, <laughs> when, jo when John Mitchell is trying to plea bargain on the tapes, there's a, there's a, there's a tape that says between, between the, the president and Haldeman saying, why don't we give them an hors d'oeuvre and maybe they won't come back for the main course. Now, the or that, that was Haldeman and Mitchell I mean, Haldeman and the president seeking to have John Mitchell go out and take the blame for everything. He was the hors d'oeuvre, and, of course, the president was the main dish. But going ahead, if you have, we, we put on tapes, we needed to put on tapes. The most important tape of all was the so-called smoking gun tape. But we had to put on tapes where, where you had President Nixon. We couldn't get him there, who was a part of the conversation. We had John Haldeman, who is a defendant we couldn't call to the stand. And we had John Ehrlichman, who is a defendant we couldn't call to the stand. So we had three people and nobody there to sponsor the tapes like John Dean or somebody who is in the conversation could. So here again, we called on. We had to find somebody who would recognize each and every voice and would be prepared as we put on a tape 
to testify that, yes, I recognize these are the voices. That's, that's the voice of the President Nixon. That's the voice of Haldeman. That's the voice of Ehrlichman. I've reviewed these and lay the foundation for these tapes. And guess who did that? Alex Butterfield. And it's all, I don't want to condemn him, but it's always, he was so cooperative to us there. It always occurred to me that maybe, maybe, um, um, what's the, Woodward and, uh, pardon me? It occurred to me, it flashed by my mind that maybe, that maybe Alex Butterfield, who is a former administrator of the Federal Aviation Administration, maybe he was just deep crow. For two weeks, uh, the tapes were played, and the people were sitting in the courtroom with these uh, ear pads uh, on. I don't know if any of you recognize uh, uh, yourselves. John Ehrlichman went on the Today Show the day after the convictions to complain that the playing of the tapes had given the jury, uh, the jurors, a warped view. Did they? Did it? When uh, the tapes were about to be played, Carl, you may remember that Judge Sirica was very stern, very strict, and he warned the audience, half of them were news people, the other half was the public, that there would be no demonstrations, there would be no cheering, no clapping, no uh, demonstration of any kind no while laughing. these tapes are being played. And my beloved partner, Bill Henley, raised his hand and said, how about crying, Judge? <laughs> <laughs> It's all right. It's all right. Is it all right if we cry a little? I don't ever, I'll never forget that line. Uh, I, I, let me ask Todd a few questions because uh, Todd Christopherson has to uh, leave at some early point to catch a plane. By the way, Todd, please tell us what you're doing today. Bring us up to date. All right. Uh, I practiced law after leaving the judge's position and uh, was with him for two years as a law clerk up until about uh, practice law after that, until 10 or 11 years ago, I guess, was called uh, for full-time service with the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in Salt Lake. So I've been uh, doing what Charles Colson does, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> okay. I wanted to ask you whether you think Judge Sirica was the right man for this, uh, for this job. Um, I think it's fair to say that the defense counsel uh, regarded him as having such a stake in the outcome of this uh, whole Watergate matter, uh, given his history of trying to get to the truth uh, uh, during the initial uh, trial of the break-in uh, defendants, that, uh, that he had, they, they uh, said that he had prejudged uh, the matter. And in fact, he did make a number of statements with the jury out of the room on a number of occasions, uh, which uh, lent some weight uh, to their uh, the argument uh, that he perhaps had overstepped. Uh, what's your view? Well, as to the jury, just to reflect on that initially, he really was uh, intent on being very careful with them, with what they heard and didn't hear, and uh, preserving, if you will, the the uh, purity of their deliberation by not having them in the room when a lot of motions were discussed or other uh, preliminary uh, testimony was, uh, was being considered as to whether it would be admissible or not. He would had some experiences, and I can't point to the specifics, uh, in the past as a trial attorney and uh, watching other judges where he felt they were too careless, I guess would be the way to say it, uh, as regards the jury, and he felt like they had to be protected so that what they actually heard in the courtroom was, in fact, uh, legitimate evidence and only that. So there was a lot of time when they were not there and, and uh, discussions and motion hearings and potential testimony was being reviewed. Uh, so I, think he was, I think he was very good about, about making sure that it was impartial as far as the jury was concerned. Should he have stepped aside, though, for the conspiracy trial? That's the question I'm putting on the table. Yeah. I, you can answer, but I also see John Dean has his hand up and Plato's... Let, let me... I, I, I obviously think he was the right man for the, for the job and did, did a remarkable job. I think Todd, who was there as a young law clerk, carried an enormous burden that uh, a lot of people don't appreciate, how busy that chamber was in those days. Uh, I remember the... Uh, an awful lot of activity that had to be briefed overnight. And the judge wasn't doing that. Uh, I assume that Todd was doing it. But one of the interesting things is there, there was a deliberate effort by John Wilson for the defense to create an error in the trial. 
And he would go around saying he was carrying an error bag in which he was collecting uh, uh, errors of Judge Sirica. Uh, Jim Neal added at one point, well, what that really is is a Ferdy bag. And no one knew what, what a Ferdy bag was, so Jim explained a Ferdy bag is a bag in which you put two pounds of manure into a one-pound bag. Needless to That's say... That's what that they call a Ferdy bag and... I said his error bag was what in Tennessee we call a ferdy bag, two pounds of manure in a one-pound bag. And and, and remember, to, to, which, to which Wilson responded, I'm tired of spending all these weeks with this guy from the Moonshine District of Tennessee. <laughs> uh, but that was the last we heard of the error bag. That's right. <laughs> Plato, Plato wants yeah, to there, there, uh, you have to remember that, that there was a, a, to your question about whether Judge Sirica should have been the judge for this case, uh, that's arguable, and the Court of Appeals, uh, after a motion to recuse him was made, uh, did not disturb him staying in the case. But you remember that he tried the original break-in, the original Cubans who did the break-in on June the 17th, and he gave out very heavy sentences, uh, justifying his name Maximum John, and he gave out provisional sentences, and he invited those defendants to come in and lessen their sentences by cooperating with the government. And uh, Jim McCord fell for it, wrote a letter, and that began the unraveling of the Watergate cover-up. A motion to recuse Judge Sirica was made. All the defendants joined in it except one, Wilson. Uh, and John Wilson told his fellow lawyers that uh, he was collecting his bag, as John Dean has described, and that he and John Sirica had been assistant U.S. attorney <clears throat> together, and he had known John Sirica for a long time, and he just knew he was going to commit error, and so he wanted Sirica to be the trial judge for that reason. <laughs> of course, he was proven wrong. So uh, he did not join the motion, but everybody else did, and we felt because of his involvement in the original break-in and the fact that he forced through McCord uh, the unraveling of this case that he had uh, prejudged it. Finally, he was chief judge at the time all this was happening, and uh, he, he, he assigned the case to himself and then step down as chief judge. Having reached age 70. Yeah. yeah. All right. yeah. Uh, by the way, uh, Jim Neal was also a, a target of some of these <laughs> attacks. Do you remember that Bill Frady's, uh, Ehrlichman's uh, lawyer, suggested that uh, you were doing all this uh, grandstanding because you wanted to go back home to back Tennessee and run for political office? I wanted to go back. I was only doing this. I only came up here to prosecute this case uh, from Tennessee because I wanted to make a name for myself and go back and... Um, um, run for governor of Tennessee. Yes, he, he floated that out uh, frequently. I have not run for governor of Tennessee. <laughs> and it's a little late now to start. Uh, uh, Todd, uh, before you escape, I want to know how the judge handled the fact that there really was a divide among the defendants. There was the White House defendants, uh, Alderman Ehrlichman. Uh, then there was the committee to reelect the president defendants, if you will, uh, Mitchell and so on. Um, that divide could have been exploited. And in fact, I think some think it was exploited uh, by Jim Neal uh, and the prosecutors. Uh, and I think Judge Sirica in his book suggests that. Under the circumstances, should the judge have separated those two, uh, uh, two factions and rather than letting them play against each other? Well, as he says there, he, he, he considered that as an issue, and, and uh, there were motions, as I recall, from time to time for a separate trial in a couple of cases. Uh, but he felt like it was a, in the end, it was a conspiracy. It was a single transaction, so to speak, and everybody was part of that, and it just wasn't practical, frankly, from a legal standpoint, to try them separately. And he, uh, you know, he felt that it was justified to go forward as one because it was one transaction when all was said and done. But they, uh, he was, he was, uh, we won one motion in front of the judge. It was a significant motion. Uh, we asked for some private rooms in the courthouse. Now, you know, all the prosecutors always are in the courthouse, defense lawyers are not. Uh, judge Sirica granted us that uh, motion. He gave us two rooms so that we could sit at lunchtime and confer among ourselves. And we called one room the White House room and one committee to reelect. Marty and Mitchell sat in one, and Alderman Ehrlichman sat in the other one. And uh, that way we didn't have to go out to lunch. We had somebody get lunch for us, and we didn't have to face the press uh, every day. 
there, there was another motion related to that in a way that was uh, went to the same end, which was that the defense would have separate tables. Instead of having one table for the prosecution in the well of the court and another table for all the defendants together, they were separate. So they wouldn't appear to all be related and working together. And that was granted. And that led to a, a little bit of a humorous incident once when Jim Neal was interrogating a witness. I can't remember who it was, but he was standing down in the middle there and asking the witness to identify among the defendants who he knew of them. And he named Haldeman here and pointed out Ehrlichman. He said, I know John Mitchell, but I don't see him. Because Jim Neal was in the line of vision, uh, uh, Mitchell was behind him. And so Mitchell stood up and he waved. And he said, here I am, <laughs> Your Honor. I think Mr. Neal is obstructing justice. <laughs> well, I, actually, I, Jake Stein, who was in the, is, this courtroom this afternoon, uh, represented uh, Ken Parkinson. If I recall correctly, at least at the beginning, uh, he and uh, Mr. Parkinson sat on a, a bench uh, sort of a, apart from the other defendants. They, didn't have a they were spectators or, or, or what? Jake and in an I, effort to underscore their distance from the court. Jake and I have been friends for years, and he wouldn't even talk to me during the course of this trial. In the courtroom. <laughs> is Jake here? He's right here. <laughs> Oh, as a matter of fact, you couldn't find him and his client. <laughs> they went back there somewhere among the spectators, and you couldn't find them. It was a, it was, it, it worked very well. I mean, it, nobody, nobody knew who Jake Client was or what he was doing there, or even where he was in the courthouse. Uh, another uh, a tactic, if I can call it that, that was used was to, to heap on John. Dean, right? Wilson called Dean a uh, mastery of chicanery and all these colorful phrases. Jim Neal, I recall, referred to the, the mean John Dean uh, a tactic or strategy uh, of, the, of the White House uh, defendants. Uh, John, how did you feel being in the middle? <laughs> well, it's never pleasant to blow the whistle. Let's get down to the bottom line. Uh, but by the time the trial had occurred, uh, we had pretty well drawn lines. And uh, while, as I say, it was not pleasant to have to testify against these men, they had launched their own attacks along with Richard Nixon to do everything they could to discredit me. So we were pretty much in open battle. And, uh, you know, they, they sort of picked the wrong guy to pick a fight with because I wasn't about to back down and uh, uh, let them have it, with, you know, as best I could, uh, always with giving the honest answer and never trying to slant the truth in any way, uh, but certainly not pulling any punches either. Uh, it was very interesting in the strategy of the different defendants, Mitchell tried to play on my former relationship with him very much uh, to bring out the fact that he had indeed, uh, on two meetings I had attended, uh, all but thrown Liddy out the window in trying to sell his crazy schemes. And of course, I'm not present at the last meeting, so they spent a lot of time developing that on cross-examination that I had never seen Mitchell approve any, any sort of illeg illegal plans. Uh, the others, uh, as I say, Wilson was probably the most hostile of the cross-examiners, but he only went so far, and he, because I had wisely followed my attorney's advice and not refused to meet with any of them before the trial, they didn't really know what my answers would be, and when Wilson walked into the first one that he didn't know what the answer was going to be, he found himself in deep trouble. When he did it the second time, uh, he realized he'd made a mistake, and he did no more of that kind of questioning. Uh, so it was, it was an interesting session. And I was, on, of course, on the stand for two weeks, ended by a rather curious remark by Judge Sirica. I don't know if you recall this, Todd, who said, why don't you just run out of this courtroom as fast as you can before they catch you in another lie? And I thought, that isn't what I hope people have left that I've said in this courtroom. Plato, you and Bill Hundley, representing Mitchell, uh, didn't attack John Dean. No. Uh, you, was, uh, you implied repeatedly that uh, Charles Colson 
was really behind this whole thing. Of course, Colson had been indicted. Uh, there were seven individuals indicted initially in the conspiracy sure. case, uh, but uh, Mitchell, uh, but uh, Colson and uh, Gordon Strong, yes, right? right. Uh, they had kind of Colson had pleaded guilty in a separate uh, earlier proceeding. It was not in this uh, case. Why did you? What, what advantage did you think there was to going after Colson? Well, because there was no advantage in going after John Dean. Uh, <laughs> he, he was a really magnificent witness, and I think Jim Neal would tell you that he's probably the best witness he ever put on the stage. Best I've ever seen in 40-plus years of trying cases. <laughs> and, uh, and, and Jim is right. Uh, his memory was impeccable, and he was articulate. And even at a time when he did not know the White House tapes existed, uh, the White House tapes, when they were finally revealed, corroborated John Dean in those sessions that he was in. So that left us to go after somebody else, and that was uh, Colson. And uh, when Mitchell asked what the defense was going to be, we said Colson. He said that's good. But that didn't work either. <laughs> well, well on, the, on the other hand, uh, Mitchell, uh, when uh, he was given the water to carry for everybody else when it was decided that he'd, he'd be the big enchilada, right, the, the hors d'oeuvre or, or whatever. Uh, I think, in fact, your He was also Bill, called by the White House the big enchilada, too. Yeah. They always talked in food terms over there in that White House. <laughs> well, uh, that's right. Give them the hors d'oeuvre, right. Maybe they won't come back for the main dish. Uh, in fact, well, your uh, Bill Hundley did say at, at one point, according to my notes, uh, that the decision was made to... Um, uh, to bomb out his old buddy, meaning Mitchell, uh, that Mitchell would be uh, the, the fall guy, uh, but he didn't warm up to that, did he? Mitchell? Mitchell. No. Uh, I, think, I think he would have been the fall guy if it would have meant exonerating uh, Nixon. I think he might have done that, but I don't think he was necessarily warm to the idea of being the fall guy for Haldeman and Ehrlich. So uh, he wasn't going to take the brunt for them. But after Mr. Nixon had been pardoned, what was the peril at that point? Well, he wasn't in any legal peril, Carl, that's true, but uh, I think Mitchell's sense of loyalty would prohibit him from trying to dump on the president. That's, he didn't, that's something he wouldn't do. But he had nothing to bargain with anyway at that point. If uh, his, bargain, his bargaining chip for the prosecutor was the president. Once the president's pardoned, you can't do anything about it. Uh, even if John Mitchell wanted to, he had no chips on the table at that point. Jim, you said when you were questioning, well, I'm sorry, it was in your closing statement to the jury, you said that Mr. Mitchell would never have gotten as far as he did to be Attorney General of the United States if he didn't know how to say no, right? Uh, well, in fact, doesn't the evidence show that was exactly Mr. Mitchell's problem, that he didn't know how to say no? Well, I don't know. You know, the one thing that people may forget, that uh, the big Watergate case was the so-called cover-up case, we never were sure, at least I never was sure, that um, the White House um, or John Mitchell really had anything to do with the, with the break-in itself. Uh, Plato, um, if, if, if the Supreme Court hadn't ruled recently that the attorney-client privilege doesn't, does survive death of a client, didn't they rule that way? So, Jim uh, Hamilton is here in the courtroom. Talk, talk, to talk to the man who brought the case Who's, right out there, Jim Hamilton. <laughs> well, Jim, wasn't the ruling that the attorney-client privilege does survive the death of the client? Okay. If that weren't true, Plato could tell us whether John Mitchell had anything to do with the break-in. But I was never completely satisfied that the president had anything to do with the original break-in. What he did set in motion was a series of efforts to, uh, well, to commit perjury, to bribe, to bribe, uh, bribe, uh, to buy silence. Um, and one of the things, one of the things in this case that was so interesting, really, was that, um, and of course, let me say that the poor defense counsel had no chance in this case because every time they would, they would put out a theory of the defense, we would play a White House tape where the, where the White House, uh, Nixon, Haldeman, Early, we would say, if we're caught, we can say. And that's just what they'd say. <laughs> they'd, they'd say at the trial. They had, the reason that, the reason that, uh, that uh, Plato and Mitchell went after Colson was, 
they had no defense, no defense at all. As I said, not only do we have the, the best witness I've ever seen testifying, we had the White House tapes where it was all laid out. And all we had to do was to play a White House, play a White House tape, and, and there it was. Later. Mitchell had no illusions about what was going to happen in, in this case. I think he knew what would happen. The only one of the defendants, I think two of them, Parkinson, who was acquitted thanks to Jake Stein, and Bob Mardian, uh, truly believed he was innocent. Uh, and in those sessions back in the rooms at the, uh, at the courthouse, uh, he would argue his case all the time. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, you know what happened, uh, he, he uh, won a reversal. He was the only one to win a reversal because of the illness of his lawyer, David Bress, and the judge uh, not granting him a severance, uh, which he should have. And so Mardian's case got severed, his conviction was reversed, and Jim, you've never retried him in these 30 years. Carl, let, let me answer Jim's question about John Mitchell's approval of the so-called third time the plan came up. I hadn't known for years, uh, when this all first started, whether in, indeed he had. I testified during the trial that on March 28th, 1973, when Mitchell and Magruder were leaning on me to lie, that I asked Mitchell, I said, I've never known from day one if you actually approved Liddy's plans. And he said, yes, I have. What I didn't know at the time and what there was no corroboration of is that he told on that same day the same situation to Bob Haldeman who would record it in his diary, which was not in evidence or not even available and didn't come out for a decade later. So Haldeman records that on, on March 28th, Mitchell told him also that yes, he had approved Liddy's plans. So there's just no question that it, it, and I've never seen a scintilla of evidence that anybody at the White House had advanced knowledge this was going to happen. Uh, and it never went higher than Mitchell, who down in Florida sets this thing in motion. And I think there's a lot of, of Liddy thinking he's James Bond when he really isn't quite Maxwell smart. <laughs> well, in fact, let, I me, have let me just say, it, you know, yeah. adding to your observations, that after listening to hours and hours of these tapes as the judge went through them to determine what would be relevant, what portions would be turned over to the prosecutors, it came to me the same way, quite clearly, that uh, President Nixon had not known ahead of time about uh, the break-in and the, the taping and tapping, if you will, at the Watergate office complex, and that he really didn't get involved until after the arrest of the, uh, those who were guilty of the break-in. And it was only a matter of days after that that they did bring to him this idea of let's send Vernon Walters from the CIA over to Patrick Gray at the FBI and say, don't trace the money, it's a matter of national security, and maybe that will turn the whole thing off. And, and he said, yes, let's do that, and without realizing, I think, that at that point he had stepped into criminal territory and committed obstruction of justice, and then it kind of bumbled on from there. There was no blueprint. There was no master plan of a, of a cover-up. It was... Although they created, a, they created a White House over there that anything goes, really. I don't... I never saw proof that President Nixon right approved the break-in, but he sure did, he sure did have a bunch of troops over there uh, who um, thought that, that basically they could do whatever they wanted to, wiretap newsmen, break into to Ellsberg, who released the Pentagon Papers, psychiatrist's office to get dirt on Ellsberg so it would uh, deflect the, the, uh, um, Bad on him, so there was a there was an atmosphere over there that John Mitchell said the White House horrors, and that's what it was. But it, it was the gang that couldn't shoot straight. I, some some years after all of these things, I went down to Miami and visited with Howard Hunt, and he told me the story about when he and Gordon Liddy went out to uh, Beverly Hills to break into, into Dr. Fielding's office to look for the Fielding Ellsberg uh, psychiatric uh, records. Being the wonderful super sleuths that they were, they knew they would need a walkie-talkies. One would go inside and one would stay outside. And so they got off the plane in Chicago. They went down to the loop by bus, taxi, bus, taxi, to throw off anybody that might be shadowing them, right? Uh, and they, they went to an, a surplus store and bought two walkie-talkies. 
then back to the airport, bus cab, bus cab, onto the plane, out to Los Angeles, rent a car, get to Dr. Fielding's office, flip on the walkie-talkies, and discover that these walkie-talkies that they bought in Chicago are the same frequency as the Los Angeles Yellow Cab Company. <laughs> Well, Carl, only to top that, they also had gone to the CIA to get some pocket litter and some disguises. And when they went to, to California, Hunt puts on a red wig, and he walks across a, a park area, and he gets hit on by a, an American Indian who thinks he's a homosexual, and, he, and rips off the wig and says, hey, Gordon, I'm not going to wear this thing. <laughs> Uh, there, there was a, a, another tactic. Uh, uh, Frades, representing uh, Ehrlichman, tried very much to play the, the um, uh, sort of the disloyalty card that, every, that, that um, Ehrlichman had been this loyal uh, associate of the president, had served the president faithfully for six years, and now, uh, said Frades, he was being tossed into the, into the street. Uh, that didn't seem to impress the jury as a, as a tactic. Why not? Jim? Oh, I, well, they were so clearly guilty. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I've, never, I've never experienced a case where you've got the crime being played out with earphones in the courthouse. Um, well, one of the things, for example, uh, one of the things they were saying on the, on the White House tapes, look, if, look, let's say all this money that we're leaving on dead drops around at various places to pay the burglars, let's say that's for Eliomasinaire purposes. And they, they put a witness on the stand, old Fred LaRue, or we put him on the stand, and allowed me to ask the question, well, Fred, if all of these payments were for Eliomasinaire purpose, charity, why did you wear gloves when you accepted the cash? I mean, it was... <laughs> now, we, we have not mentioned, maybe we should... Uh, with respect to Kenneth Parkinson and uh, Robert Mardian, whose, whose names have come up here, some may not recall uh, that their roles were, I think it's fair to say, quite uh, peripheral uh, in the case of Mr. Mardian, and it had to do with getting Gordon Liddy out to, what, Burning Tree Country Club to try to get Klein Deans to uh, get the uh, initial burglars uh, released, yeah. right? right. Uh, in the case of uh, Mr. Mardian, it had to do with raising uh, some of that hush money, which uh, they, they claim was that he didn't know it was hush money. It did amount to a considerable piece of change. It was over $400,000. But uh, at one point uh, in the, in the uh, trial, uh, this was uh, represented as sort of, uh, this, that there was no criminal purpose behind raising that money. That is what a family would do sitting around the kitchen table when they learn one of their members uh, is in trouble. Uh, who came up with that argument? Plato, do you plead guilty? It wasn't me. No, it wasn't you. Okay. Uh, well, it didn't work. Uh, we have uh, gone about uh, one hour, and our usual uh, procedure here is in the remaining uh, 30 minutes that uh, we've rented the hall for. Uh, I'm willing to, or the panel is willing, uh, to take your questions if you have any. If you have none, of course, we can go on. Uh, but the idea is that there be some involvement uh, of you as well. Uh, in the course of our, our program. Anybody have a question uh, that they want to raise? I hear a voice, yes. Could you refresh our memories regarding uh, President Nixon's health? Yes, he had phlebitis, uh, which was a, a, a these, what are thromboses? He had lots of things. He, phlebitis was just one of them. He had hypertension. He had uh, a, a series of illness, and it actually ended with pneumonia where he is hospitalized. Uh, and he so goes. This was in California yes. after he had. Resigned. And he goes on the critical list in California. So uh, Judge Sirica finally, when he's released from the hospital, sent a three-member panel of judges out uh, to doctors uh, to to judge uh, whether or not he indeed is ill, and they find he is. And Herbert Miller, his lawyer, says he's really not capable of, of testifying. And Judge Sirica finally ruled, indeed, that uh, he was not and would not be a witness. Well, what about tape? What about putting his testimony on tape out there? Well, there was talk of that, but apparently he wasn't well enough to even sit for a video uh, deposition. Well, we were going to take a deposition. That was, the, that was the backup. But the final conclusion was, I believe, that Judge Sirica finally uh, concluded that uh, 
based on the best advice he was given, he wouldn't allow he wouldn't allow even that to happen. Isn't that right, uh, Todd? Right. Right. Yeah, it's what uh, John said that the doctors felt he wasn't even up to that at that point, and wouldn't be until sometime later in 1975. I do not think his testimony would have exonerated the defendants, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> you know, one of the interesting things, Carl, from being in behind the scenes, I must, must add also, is Jim Neal, watching him in the trial, where he really starts out in everybody, all the defendants are kind of equal to him. And by the end of the trial, he actually, I, I'm speaking, I'll let him speak for himself, but as I saw it, he actually admired John Mitchell. He actually had a bitter taste in his mouth about John Ehrlichman. Is that correct? Oh, that's, that's absolutely true. As a matter of fact, uh, we're known in Tennessee for our country hams. And I like John Mitchell so much during this trial. I was going to convict him. That was never any, never, never in doubt. Um, but I did like the guy. Here's a guy who was willing to meet with me and take the blame for everything if we let his president go. Now, boy, that's, that's some kind of uh, loyalty. In it. So you, uh, he did wrong. I was going to convict him. I was going to send him to the penitentiary. But I kind of liked him. So one day after going home to Tennessee, I brought back a country ham for John Mitchell. Well, the media saw me bringing in a country ham, and they immediately had John Mitchell, me, I don't know whether it was you or Bill Hundley, and the ham... I was holding a ham, and there was John Mitchell, and the caption underneath I was obvious, uh, you know, which is the ham. You know? <laughs> but, uh, now, like John Mitchell, I got to, I got to like, dislike very much um, uh, John Ehrlichman. As a matter of fact, I've never been, I think these prison, the term of prison sentences we have now are just outrageous. And indeed, either, either Plato Kacharis or Bill Hundley called me up one day and said, we're trying to get John Mitchell out early. It would help. And this was traditional in those, in those days where you could get him out early. Now you, now you can't, my God. Um, it would help if you would write a letter saying, as prosecutor, you have no objection to John Mitchell getting out early. And Plato, I wrote that letter. Sure. And I want to say something else while we're on that subject. When David Bress became ill during the trial and was absent for a good six weeks because it was discovered he had cancer, uh, there was a motion made by Tom Green, who was representing uh, Mardian together with uh, Dave Bress, to sever him out. And to his credit, Jim Neal did not object to that motion. And eventually the Court of Appeals eventually granted that motion and severed mm -hmm. Mardian out, reversed his conviction. I want to point out uh, the uh, convictions came on... Uh on New Year's Day, and actually came as the, as the Rose Bowl <laughs> was being played out in uh, Pasadena. I don't recall who was playing, perhaps. Uh, who? <laughs> uh, but I, I have my little cheat sheet here. There's a little sheet that you use on, on camera to try to give the breakdown as to who was, sent, who was convicted of what. Uh, and I, uh, I, I noticed a couple of things. You mentioned about John Mitchell. We asked John Mitchell as he was leaving uh, what he was going to do next uh, or where he, where he was going to go. Uh, an ex, and he said, to the moon. <laughs> That's the last place left. I also noticed on my notes, this, this verdict came during a halftime in the Rose Bowl that I, I wrote on my little sheet here, now back to the Rose Bowl and Kurt Gowdy. <laughs> <laughs> One of the interesting, excuse me, there's a, I understand there's a play on Broadway or something about Martha, John Mitchell's wife. Um, she was quite an interesting human being, and if I'd return home to Nashville for a weekend, I wouldn't, during the trial and even right before the trial, uh, there wouldn't be, I wouldn't even be settled down until the phone would ring and I'd get a call from Martha Mitchell giving me hell for not giving John Mitchell a hard enough time. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's loyalty. Uh, I saw a hand back there. Go ahead. Are there any more Watergate tapes, uh, any more parts of them due to be released? There are, there's a steady stream of tapes coming out. They have, the last uh, batch that was released by the archives was the largest. Uh, they're probably 80% completed. 
And today, the tapes are no longer exclusively held by the archives. One can order tapes from the archives, take them out. I did a book called The Rehnquist Choice, where I had to literally go out and listen to the tapes there and, and record them and have stenographers or what have you uh, help me do it. Today, you can, the tapes are available. In fact, there are a couple places online that have, have the tapes. One site I know is www.h P-O-L, History and Politics Online, where they have a number of the tapes there. Uh, I'm, I'm told there are a couple other s sites, but uh, yes, the, 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 most of them are out, uh, excepting for anything that was personal, relating to the Nixon talking to, say, his daughters. Uh, and there are a couple of those because they did deal with official business, but private materials have been literally clipped out of the tapes and will never be available, but the rest of it will be. The, all of the originals are at the National Archive in College Park. Is there another question? Yes, sir. Don't I remember that one of the tapes is the uh, famous gap, perhaps a 17 second gap? 18 minutes. 18, 18, 18 minutes. Yeah, a little off on the time. But what tape was that? I mean, was that gap ever, ever filled? It was the first day, here I am. It was June 20. It's, 70. it's the first day Nixon's back at the, uh, uh, at the White House from Florida after the break-in, and it's a meeting between Haldeman and Mitchell, and clearly from Haldeman's notes, it's a, uh, uh, it's a conversation about Watergate. Let me turn it over to Todd. I'll tell you what happened in the courtroom, which was far more thrilling. <laughs> <laughs> no, the, the, uh, when those original tapes were produced. I don't know how many were, I can't remember, about nine different tapes were subpoenaed initially, and that's where all the battle came and ended up in the firing of Archibald Cox and the later appointment of Leon Jaworski, the Saturday Night Massacre that was uh, referred to and so on. But uh, those were finally delivered to the court, and I guess it was Fred Buzzart, wasn't it, that was uh, White House counsel at the time, and he, uh, when the time came to deliver them, sheepishly came in and said, guess what, there are two we don't have. And they initially thought it was a glitch in the recording system, but what it really was was the tapes had run out. I mean, these were sound-activated April 15th. tapes. And the, uh, if there was enough noise or meetings or things going on, they might run out of the entire reel before the, the day ended, and there would just be no recording until the machine switched it over to the to the next, the next tape for the next day. And so those were missing, and everybody thought that was uh, bad enough. And then he had to come in later and say, by the way, we found one that has this 18-minute gap in it. And as you said, it coincided with uh, Haldeman's notes that at that, that was the point in the conversation or the meeting that a Watergate was being discussed. Don't we recall that the absence was due to a sinister force? Uh, that's that was Hague's, that was Hague's, Hague's comment. <laughs> But, you know, Judge Sirica did have a panel study. The, 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 uh, yeah, there were six, uh, a panel of experts of six that were called in from different points in the country that were the technology experts at the time and examined it. They concluded that there had been at least five stops and starts in that 18-minute gap, and, and so it appeared to be intentional. And I don't know if we ever, I don't, maybe, John, you know who well, ever there's did There's never it, been any doubt in my mind. Ever, who, who could, who had access to the machine? You had Rosemary Woods, who knew how to run a machine very well. She, in fact, the machine was in her office. You had Steve Bull, who used to queue up the machines. He's very mechanical. And the third person was somebody who I used to watch in the Oval Office who could barely open one of those medicine bottles where you had to press it down and turn it. He'd put it in his mouth and he could barely get a drawer open. So when I saw that it took five to, to possibly seven times to do the erasing, there was no doubt in my mind who had tried to erase that section of the tape. It was the fellow with the bottle. Right? It was the fellow with the bottle. <laughs> but you do remember what was ironical, of course, was that, you know, this was just a drop in the ocean. And to erase that little bit made no difference whatsoever in the, in the end result. I mean, it was trying to, trying to pull one bucket out of the ocean and make a difference. But surely you remember the photo of the Rosemary Stretch? <laughs> which appeared on the front cover of magazines and so on, of Miss Woods uh, uh, trying to demonstrate... Uh, oh, it might have accidentally. Uh, oh, the accident, right. 
uh, had happened. Yes, sir. Mr. Green, I, I think we know who you're talking about, but who is the person? Who had the bottle? Yes. Well, it was Mr. Nixon, uh, <laughs> who couldn't get that medicine bottle open. And I always used to, I didn't know whether I should say something. You press down, Mr. President, then you turn it. Or, <laughs> but I'd watch him get it, and I'd same thing. I'd see him trying to open the drawer, and the drawer wouldn't open. And it was, uh, he just wasn't, he was somebody who hadn't driven a car in a long time, and he wasn't very mechanical. And so uh, to have that erasing process, whoever tried to erase it, and it could have been, to me, an accidental error, where he might have tried to turn the machine on, stop it, start it again, and it would, could very easily uh, have, have been uh, a, a, an accidental erasure. Uh, Jim, uh, would you uh, tell us uh, what you're doing these days and whether Watergate made any, made any difference in your life? Well, I'm, I'm, um, I'm uh, living in Nashville, Tennessee. I'm uh, traveling around the country now defending uh, innocent people. <laughs> I've always made a practice of prosecuting only the guilty and defending only the innocent. Uh, <laughs> and I'm, uh, I'm defending people um, around the country. Since those days, um, I've had several cases. I defended Ford Motor Company when he was indicted for homicide in connection with the Pinto, first manufacturer of a product to have been indicted for homicide in connection with the development marketing of a product, and then I went out thereafter and defended, I don't know whether many of you have seen the helicopter crash and killed actor Vic Barr and the two kids, and I went out and defended the director of the Twilight Zone um, at there, so I'm just, I'm just doing, uh, I'm on the other side of the, I'm sitting at that other table over there now and uh, still in the courtroom. Well, you had, you had more than 15 minutes of fame. I want to know whether that's, that's stuck with you over these years. Do people still come up and remember your role? Well, yeah, I've had different roles. First time I was for years, between the time I convicted Hoffa and Watergate, I was known only as that fellow who convicted uh, Hoffa. Then after Watergate, I was, only, I was known uh, as the Watergate prosecutor. But, you know, boy, you... It doesn't take much. You, you know, you, don't, you get over that pretty quickly. I remember after Watergate, I go back to Nashville, got an enormous publicity in the papers and television and so forth. So I go out to the hospital to visit a friend, and this guy comes up to me, and he looks at me that way, and he looks at me that way, and finally he says, you know, I believe I know you. And I said, well, <laughs> I thought I was being modest. Well, I've been on television a little bit. He said, oh, are you a country music star? <laughs> so um, <laughs> fame is fleeting. But uh, John, uh, we've kept up with your activities to some extent, but uh, fill us in on what you're doing. Well, for years I uh, kept a low profile. I did do a lecture tour immediately after Watergate and then went back to school and studied accounting for some five or six years and at, at night went into business and had some good success in, in what I call private investment banking. Promised myself when I turned 60, I would return to writing. Didn't quite make it at 60, but by the time I was 61, I did. I'm now on my seventh book. My last one uh, did not get me an invitation to dinner at the White House, but it did uh, uh, stay 22 weeks on the New York Times bestseller list uh, called Worse Than Watergate, The Secret Presidency of George W. Bush. Uh, and I am cranking books out uh, and enjoying it tremendously. Did you tell me you have three grandchildren? I have three granddaughters, yes. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and that's, of course, always a pleasure. Todd, do you want to add anything? We already... I have five grandchildren. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> I have some pictures here, if you'd like to see. <laughs> he has the uh, DVD in the car, if you want yeah, to look right. at them later. <laughs> Plato? I'm still like uh, Jim Neal, still defending people accused of crime. I apparently don't have the luxury of defending those that are innocent like Jim does, so a lot of mine get convicted. And so I spend a lot of time visiting jails around the country. Well, usually we do the introductions at the beginning, but I thought we wanted to get right into the meat of this thing, and I hope you uh, enjoyed the program as much as I did. Thank you for coming. Uh,
thanks to Carl and thank you panel members, you are wonderful. We have a light refreshments in the corridor and I hope you'll all step out there and exchange your views and perhaps the panelists and Carl will join us and we can ask him a few questions. Thank you for coming.